Welcome to the Eye on College Basketball YouTube channel. Uh, my name is David Cobb. I'm joined by Adam Finkelstein, along with the Union Pacific Railroad right outside my door. They wanted to be a part of today's production. So uh, hello, Union Pacific. Uh, it is no such thing as an offseason for us, especially for my man, Adam. He was the director of scouting for 24-7 Sports. And the, this time of year, he's known as a, a road warrior. We were talking about it a little bit before uh, we started this, this video. But Adam, give us the rundown on what life is like for you in the month of July. Well, it's uh, it's pretty busy. Um, I, I was jo I'm home right now for a, a glorious 36 hours before we get back on the road. Um, you know, in, in theory, the July recruiting period has has shrunk a little bit over the years. It's just uh, two five day periods, and it's separated by about 10 days off in between. But um, that doesn't mean there's not basketball being played. So we just finished the first of those those five day periods. I spent three days uh, in the Atlanta area uh, for the Under Armour Association. Then I went and checked out the last full day of uh, Adidas 3 SSB. That was in Rock Hill, South Carolina, right outside of Charlotte. And then as I was making my way back home, I uh, stopped at, uh, in Mannheim, Pennsylvania, uh, at Spooky Nook Sports, which is just a, a monstrous indoor facility where the Hoop Group was was running a independent event. It had a lot of... Uh, a lot of division one sleepers. So I did that on Sunday last night it was a uh, fourth bed in four, four nights, but it was my own. So, so we'll take that. And tomorrow I, I take off again, going back to Rock Hill for the Adidas all American camp and then peach jam, which is Nike's culminating event that tips Sunday morning and will run for eight straight days. And after that, um, don't expect to hear from me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, I think you will have earned a little bit of time off come uh, mid to late August. I don't really know when uh, people who do recruiting take time off, both in the sport as coaches and as assistants, but also people like you. Because for me, at least, as somebody who primarily covers on court and on field with football, uh, with what I do on that side, I do know when my off season is, and that doesn't mean I'm not doing anything. But it just know I just know there is a time that's coming when I can catch my breath. What is that time like uh, for, for the people on, on your side of things? When do you get that? I mean, I think in theory it's August, but I mean, listen, I, I've got a screw loose. I kind of like this stuff, you know, mm -hmm. like we were, I mean, for me, it's all, it's like a jigsaw puzzle you're trying to put together. You're trying to make sure you, you see all the pieces, meaning, meaning the players, you can, you can sort them and figure out where they go and what order. And, and that to me is the fun of it every summer. And then it evolves over the course of the high school season. But um, and, and, you know, August is theoretically the time where there's there's not as much, but but it's also a very uh, news heavy time because a lot of stuff is, you know, kids are starting to take their visits and starting to make decisions and stuff like that. So um, but again, it's all good. I mean, it it, uh, it, it beats a real job, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It does. Yeah. You're a, you're a hoops head. You came to this from from the coaching side of things. So this has been your life for a long time. And, you know, the, these summer events on the basketball circuit from the grassroots level stuff all the way up to NBA Summer League, just a tremendous time to network as well. When I was an NBA beat writer covering the Grizzlies for a couple of years, I uh, got to go out to Las Vegas for NBA Summer League. And it was just amazing. The types of people who you were rubbing shoulders with. There's college coaches, tons of NBA coaches, NBA execs, players, agents, media folks, you name it. And to just be in that environment where, oh, by the way, the fans in that environment are within close proximity to all these same people as well. It just sort of, uh, it puts a human face on something that for me, a lot of times I end up, you know, taking games in from TV and, and kind of have that uh, screen in between me and the action. And so to get out there and, and network and be around people like that, that's that's an underrated part of what you're doing right now is the ability to get out there, make connections, have conversations with people, AAU coaches, uh, parents, coaches uh, from the college side. You know, and, and it sounds like uh, with this being what a 10 day dead period here, uh, the next time you're on the road, some of these high school prospects will be playing in front of NBA scouts. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and, and what you said is absolutely right. I mean, there's, you know, those 10 days in July where college coaches are out um, is, is obviously an, an opportunity to kind of, uh, you know, catch up with them in person. Obviously we're, we're in contact with a lot of them uh, just kind of through this, this college basketball 
recruiting network throughout the course of the year. But it's 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 almost like, you know, one of several national conventions during the course of the year when everybody kind of uh, converges on the same locations. And, you know, you even see them on your flights going from one spot to the other. That's that's kind of the uh, the irony of all this. So uh, and yes, the Peach Jam tips on Sunday and college coaches aren't out until Wednesday. So those first three days will be exclusively uh, in front of NBA scouts. But there's also, you know, there's a there's a greater uh, grassroots basketball community where you see a lot of the same people. And and it's the coaches, it's the players, it's the people who are, you know, whether they're affiliated with sneaker companies or event management companies or whatever the case may be. But there's, there's definitely a community that goes along with it as well. But when college coaches and NBA scouts are out, it adds another uh, another element to that. So there's your peek behind the curtain into uh, what this time of year is like from the media perspective. But now we, we got to get down to the nitty gritty. And I know it hasn't been long. This this evaluation period is still uh, in its early stages. But you were just on the road watching live basketball for several days. And I'm curious to know what some of your takeaways are. Did any players particularly pop or, or surprise you that you were able to see over these last few days? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, my strategy for July is to kind of focus on um one sneaker circuit at a time so i did three days at under armor i would say right now even though i'm home i'm kind of in the midst of the adidas swing because i i uh, was at their tournament and it was actually uh the second time i've attended one of their their tournaments i shouldn't say or the grassroots events this this spring so i saw them in south carolina in april saw them again this past week and i'm going back to their their camp this week so i'm in the midst of my adidas swing and then i'll finish out uh, at the peach jam with nike so to start with Under Armour, which is kind of something that that at this point is is relatively complete, because in June um, I was in Florida at their national camp, and then uh, as I said last week in the Atlanta area. So, uh, and that's what I've been working on today. You know, you you see them and you're trying to put together your lists. As I said, that that kind of jigsaw puzzle. Make sure you've got people in the right order. Um, I think as I kind of glance over my notes here, the guy who is has really emerged at Under Armour so far is El Marco Jackson. He plays for. Uh, a team in the Mid-Atlantic region called We Are One, led by Terrell Myers, longtime director of that program. But El Marco Jackson is a big six foot four lead guard who just has a tremendous combination of size and pace. And he gets downhill as well as just about anyone. I mean, he is big and strong. He can go through contact, but he can also go right by you. Uh, the thing that really impressed me about him this, this week, and, and we've seen kind of signs of this, in the weeks and months leading up to this was his decision-making ability. He used to kind of be a bull in a China shop relying solely on those physical um, kind of characteristics. But what we saw this week is how much his vision and decision-making have really improved. You know, he was reading help side defenses, making the right decision, depending on how, how uh, opposing defenses were rotating. I even said to one, you know, I was talking to one of the coaches that's recruiting him and I said, I don't even know if he's aware he's doing this, just like reading the help side, or if he just thinks like, oh, that guy's open, I'm throwing it to him. And the coach said, no, 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 I've, you know, in being able to talk to him, he's really like working on this. So it's fun to watch a guy like that, someone who initially made his reputation because of his physical tools, but is now really developing the mental side of the game as well. He's he's certainly someone um, that has really come on from the Under Armour Association. I, the Houston Defenders won the championship last week. And Jamari, Jamari McDowell was someone that I really liked. He's a 6'5 wing. He's long. He's athletic. He's really evolved as a shooter. He didn't have that reputation early on in his career, but he's making shots now. Uh, I think in time, he's going to evolve into someone who's a potential secondary ball handler. He's got a pull-up game. For someone who's long, who's as long and athletic as he is, um, you know, I'd like to see him finish a little bit more around the rim, but you know, one of the things that was really kind of on my mind coming out of draft season is the guys we were talking about leading up to the draft. A lot of them weren't necessarily high profile guys in high school. So that was that had really resonated with me here. And I, I was telling somebody and this isn't to put unrealistic expectations on anybody, but I said, like, hey, you know, you don't necessarily have to go be the loudest guy in the gym to have a chance to be the best prospect two or three or five or even 10 years down the road. Like what markers are we, should we maybe be paying a little more attention to other than just, Hey, who dominated this AAU game? And I think Jamari McDowell, when you look at like 
the size, the length, the athleticism, the evolving skill, those three and D type variables, that type of potential. It's it just it's intriguing. It's certainly not a guarantee of anything, but it's intriguing. And it made him someone that that, um, you know, I came away impressed with uh, this week for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I had I had Jamari McDowell on my list of, of people to ask you about because I saw you'd written about him. And I think he's a perfect example of just how far into this you guys get, because uh, for reference, he's ranked number 144 right now at 24 seven in the class of 2023. And Adam is you know, sitting here breaking down this guy's game in detail. And that's just amazing to me because you're talking about three classes worth of players who you can go 200 deep on. How do you do it? How do you organize your thoughts? How do you begin to get that jigsaw puzzle in order? Because I know if I ever actually do a puzzle, you know, you sort of categorize the pieces based on color and, you know, it's a long process. I mean, what's that like? Uh, with you using that analogy, you know, when you're talking about looking at guys now, not only in the class of 2023, but 24 as well, maybe even further out than that, how do you begin to organize a class in your mind? Well, I put the priority on the older kids uh, for a couple different reasons. I, I like, you know, with 24 and 25, especially 25, the younger you are, I think like I want to get a quick snapshot of where you're at, you know, in terms of the types of tools you have, but I'm probably not going to invest the same amount of time um, breaking down the nuances of your game, because I'm expecting your game to evolve in the next, you know, two, three, five years, even, you know, even the older kids, the rising seniors, they're in the very earliest stages of their overall development too. Um, so with the younger kids, again, it's, it's more about just a snapshot of where they are, but the building blocks is, as we say is, is, um, you know, that's why I'm kind of doing this one circuit at a time, because I really want to stay there, make sure I get, a a really do a deep dive on that circuit and have a really good understanding of where kids within each circuit compare to each other uh, from a positional standpoint first. And then, you know, if you've got, you know, Under Armour, Adidas and Nike, and you've got the order kind of, I mean, it's always debatable, but if you've got your order pretty well established within those, and then that can fill into a, a greater list. And then of course you have kids who are not on a national circuit. I mean, you've got like, you know, Xavier Booker, who's one of the best players in the country, does not play on a sneaker circuit. He was in an event in Atlanta as well. And both uh, Eric Bossy and Travis Branham went over and, and got eyes on him. As I said on Sunday, I was at an independent event, too. So you really have four matches because you have you have Nike, Adidas, Under Armour and then the independents. And you're trying to get them, organize them within each batch and then have them funnel into uh, into a national list. At least that's that's the way I've always approached it. And that's kind of. Um, you know, that's the phil- uh, philosophy that I've kind of been basing my schedule around this summer. How willing are you as a talent evaluator and scouting director for 24-7 to branch out, go to the auxiliary gym, take a chance on looking for that next Damian Lillard or John Morant? All these stories we sometimes hear about the guys who are going through this at age 16 or 17 got overlooked. You know, everybody knows the story about Ja and how the Murray State assistant went to find a bag of Cheetos and you know, stumbled upon this like elite talent playing on the, you know, a court. Yeah, it was 145 pounds at the time. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, do you just kind of like scoff at those stories? Because I'm sure there's a lot of like handlers and uh, riffraff out there who want you to go check out their guy who's going to be the next big thing. But then like, how do you know if that's like even semi legit? Like, where where do you fall on like being will- billing, being willing to go down the rabbit hole for somebody who you're really not all that sure about? Well, there's a couple of things to unpack there. I think the first is a matter of efficiency. Um, you know, like the sneaker circuits, you know, um, there are kids there that you know you have to see. So from my standpoint, it's about first seeing the kids that you know you have to see first and foremost, and then about looking for new kids and doing your due diligence. I, I wrote about this the other day because, you know, even in our summer coverage, like I was at day three of Under Armour. And there were, I think, 13 game sets throughout the course of the day. And there's 12 courts in the building, something like that. So there's over 120 basketball games being played in one building in that day. So there's no way that I can see them all. There's no way I can see, you know, half of them, a quarter of them. Um, Even, you know, uh, having two of us there on, on two of those three days, there's no way we can understand what's going on. So if your goal is to provide the kind of the the college basketball, the recruiting fans with an update of like how things are going, 
you've basically got two choices. You can follow kind of the crowd, see who, who coaches are, are going to watch, or you can also, to a point you made earlier, kind of interact with the coaches, see who's got a buzz because they'll, you know, it's just in the conversation. They'll, they'll say, Oh, did you see such and such? And that was, so that was Thursday's article I wrote about like the, the players at Under Armour who had kind of popped and, and had really started to make a name for themselves, not necessarily that they were going to become national nationally ranked prospects. Maybe they will, but you know, who had really seized the opportunity. There was another guy Saturday at Adidas, um, Davin Cosby from uh, team loaded Virginia came in as a mid-major recruit, ended up getting offered by um, uh, Alabama, California, Wake Forest, Maryland. I mean, over the course of four days. And, and so, um, but I think the the point that that speaks to, and, and really what you're talking about with the Dame Lillard stories is um, uh, Dame Lillard is just one of them. John Morant is a player you mentioned, Steph Curry, Kawhi Leonard. I mean, you could you could go on and on. Like players are going to emerge at various stages, and so from a, a one of the reasons why I enjoy my job so much is because I don't have to stop when they leave high school. Like when you think about it, if you're trying to evaluate a player throughout and project them throughout the duration of their career, the end of high school is a somewhat like arbitrary deadline because you could be Anthony Davis and, and, you know, evolve as a senior in high school, or maybe you're Steph Curry and you, you really start to pop in college or guys are going to evolve at various stages along the way. And so this is just literally the first chapter of the story where you're trying to get a sense of markers that can help you project the future, but you've got to continue to to follow them in fact like i think it's really interesting and this is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine like in the grassroots world the people who consume this content want so much certainty with it you know they want to hear he's a pro he's this he's that and the reality is like you just can't say that because you can you can look at some of the very best grassroots prospects we've had over the course of the last decade and some of those biggest names have not made it as pros. So literally no one is, is a guarantee. Okay, LeBron James, he was a guarantee. But there's so many other of these guys who, whether it's through, through uh, you know, a lack of humility or um, maybe they make bad decisions off the floor, maybe they get injured. Like Harry Giles is one of the best players I've seen in the last decade. But, you know, his knees just never allowed him to be the, the player he was capable of being. So things evolve at such a rapid rate. And what's interesting to me is a couple of years down the road, when you talk about like the NBA and they're drafting guys who are even older than players in high school, they're willing to acknowledge that there's a, a wider range of possible outcomes. And, you know, you at that level, you hear things more like, well, if he hits, you know, in high school, it's almost like unacceptable to talk like that when the reality is it's even more so the case we just don't know it's way too early so you're trying to identify markers and figure out who's got the best chance of hitting or blossoming but as i said prospects are going to evolve at different stages along the way and that's that's what makes it really interesting um especially now that that you know i'm able to follow prospects all the way up through the journey to the draft it makes it makes uh for a lot of fun yeah, very good. Now that we've covered the abstract and the philosophical uh, questions uh, as it pertains to scouting high school talent, you mentioned a guy by the name of LeBron James, and I think this will be great for headlining purposes. I think this will be great for clipping a video to discuss uh, this particular player. Some of you may know LeBron James has a son in the class of 2023, and I know you weren't expecting me to ask you about him. But Bronny James, when are we going to see him? What is his status right now? I notice he's kind of floating in that 40 to 60 range in the class, which is pretty doggone good. Like that that means you're, you know, a, a four-star guy and like could maybe even like be a swing five-star guy if you have a great summer. So like wh what's the deal with Bronny? When are we going to see him and like what kind of player is he becoming at this point in his development? I think Bronny is a very good player. Um, I don't think that he is necessarily uh, as dynamic as people want him to be, given, you know, who his dad is. But, um, you know, I, I did a fairly deep dive on this coming out of the April recruiting period. And, you know, listen, when you are when you are LeBron James's son, namesake, and uh, you have all of this, you're probably – the most scrutinized player, high school player in the country. And you've been that since you were, you know, an underclassman, everybody wants you to be the second coming of your dad. The reality is he's not that, but uh, historically speaking, 
you know, I would have to obviously go back and check this, but I'm not sure we've ever seen anybody be that. You know what I mean? Because the pressure that that Bronny and, you know, I think about like Michael Jordan's kids and stuff like that. You know, we've we've just saw Scottie Pippen's kid um, go through his career at Vanderbilt. He's in the NBA summer league right now with uh, with the Lakers. So the pressure that these guys have to face, ironically, is on the same team as uh, Shaquille O'Neal's kid, is just um, more than I could ever possibly relate to. Because the burden of the expectations is um, is just massive. And that, to me, is probably the most impressive part about where Bronny is at, is that um, he plays the right way. He doesn't go out there and play like somebody who's trying to to prove anything to anyone. I mean, he's a very good passer. He moves the ball. He's a good defender. He does things that impact winning and um, has a maturity about the way that he approaches the game. He's not out there, believe it or not, making a ton of like no one is followed by more cameras and he doesn't play to the cameras you know, almost ever at all. I mean, again, there's just maturity about him. So here's the breakdown about his game. A big guard, good size, not great size, good size, strong body, has evolved athletically over the course of his high school career, but um, is not a dynamic creator off the bounce. He's a guy who can play on or off the ball as a combo guard. He's he's a reliable handler. Um, as I said, very good passer, good feel for the game, good shooter, Has a uh, makes open shots. And so he's a guy that that is going to I, I don't know that he's going to go to college, but if he did, I think he would impact winning um, pretty quickly. You'd be able to I mean, think about the kind of guy who like usually goes to Villanova, you know, moves the ball, makes open shots, um, is, uh, you know, switchable defensively. I mean, that's really what, what Bronny James is. He's not necessarily the guy who's going to come down, cross you up three times and, and go make like the, the John ja Morant type of play. And I think people want that from him because of because of, uh, you know, his name. But that's not really who he is. And I think a lot of a lot of that goes to the maturity in his approach to not to just be a smart, efficient, winning basketball player and not worry as much about those highlights or, or you know, stats even. Well, I mean, he's been in the spotlight for years. And then you think about the type of player that LeBron is obviously incredibly physically gifted the iconic highlights of his career will be the chase down blocks, the electric dunks. But at this stage in his career, he's still thriving based on the fact that he's such a high IQ player. So to hear you describe Bronny, I guess it's not all that surprising that you're describing a really high IQ basketball player because that's what LeBron James is. He's an immensely high IQ basketball player. I mean, the the one that always flashes back to my mind is that scene from this past season where he's trying to explain uh, something to Austin Reeves, who yeah. was a four-year college player who played under some really good college coaches. And Austin Reeves just, like, cannot process what LeBron is trying to tell him on the court. And I think that's just a, a perfect gif size illustration of sort of the high level of, of IQ that, that LeBron plays with. So it's not, it's not shocking to hear you describe Bronny in those terms. No, he's smart, but he's also mature. I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, know Bronny personally. Um, but the way in which the thing that impresses me most about him, given the the microscope he's been under since he was a freshman in high school, if not before, is the maturity with which he brings to the game. You know, playing within himself, playing winning basketball, uh, not worrying about the individual stuff. Um, that to me is is uh, especially as a dad, quite frankly, is is very impressive. Yeah. So th that's uh, it for the recruiting talk, I guess, for the most part. But, you know, if you're like me and you're kind of curious about what's going to impact the court next season, you might be curious to know if there's going to be any more guys who are going to reclassify uh, into the 2022 class, right, and impact a, a roster next season. It's something we saw in a really high-profile way uh, around this time last year when Amani Bates and Jalen Duran reclassified to join the Memphis roster. Uh Kylan Boswell is a big name who recently reclassed. He's going to play for Arizona this next year. A uh, five-star guy in the 20s uh, in terms of his player ranking. Going to be huge for Arizona after they lose Dalen Terry somewhat unexpectedly to the draft after he had a you know a, a really good pre-draft process. And obviously they're replacing Ben Matherin as well. So uh, Kylan Boswell going to Arizona as a reclass. Tyrese Proctor is going to Duke. As a reclass, I think he was early June after Trevor Keels made his decision 
uh, when, when Proctor decided that he was going to go ahead and, and jump into the class of 2022. I mean, are there any other guys on the, on the radar? Are you expecting any movement uh, from 2023 guys who might try to get things done early and, and join college rosters for the next season? Yes. Do I have to okay. elaborate? Um, yeah. The, uh, the, Give us some hits. Yeah, Give us some I, hits. I, I, I am. Um, I, think, I think a lot of that is still evolving. Um, I mean, listen, the one that everybody's speculating about right now, I'm not, this is not breaking news. This is, this is uh, being talked about pretty consistently, but what, what is Gigi Jackson going to do? He's the number one uh, prospect in the class. He's committed to North Carolina. There's all sorts of rumors. Um, he's not, you know, he's really not um, talking publicly about it right now, but, but he is certainly the one that, that everybody is watching and, and waiting to see what he's going to do. Um, Ugana Kingsley is, is another one. He was at Putnam Science Academy last year, uh, won a national prep championship. He just took part in the NBA Academies program because he attended one of the academies before arriving at Putnam Science. So he's another one that is, is pretty well known to be contemplating a move to 22. Um, but what I'll say is this, is that this, this, um, you know, kids, I'd rather refer to it as leaving high school earlier than expected than reclassifying. Because reclassifying is uh, implying that they're all necessarily going to go to college. And I'm not sure that's the case. I mean, I think the G League Ignite is going to be a, an option. I think Overtime Elite is going to be an option. And we don't need to look back any further than what happened last summer, really from May to October, to kind of see the precedent for this. You had um, the Thompson Twins. They, they went to Overtime Elite. Then you had... Um, uh, then you had uh, both Amani and Jalen Duran. They played the Peach Jam. They were originally in the uh, they were originally in the class of 2022. Then they said, "Okay, no, we're going to 21." That left Shaden Sharp as the top ranked prospect in the country. And then it became a really, you know, a really bad secret that he was going to go to college early, even though he didn't necessarily play. But still, that put him in, into 2021. And so I, I think you've got a that's a, a precedent that people are going to continue to follow. So in my mind, there's a lot of variables that, that impact it. I think development is certainly one of them. You know, a guy like Kyle, Kylan Boswell is probably saying to himself, am I going to get better this year uh, at Arizona or am I going to get better staying in high school? Um, typically, uh, we'll see a, a rush of these types of decisions after the summer is done, after these, these kids are done playing uh, their grassroots summers, and then potentially they might move on to college. But I would look at it in terms of not necessarily early jumps to college, but just, you know, as a thought of, do I, is this extra year of high school going to serve me, especially if I can make myself eligible for the draft a year earlier? And that, of course, has a lot to do with their birth dates and things like that. So whether it's whether it's a move to G League Ignite, whether it's a move to Overtime Elite, whether it's a move to college basketball a year earlier, I think all those things are going to be very much on the table in the coming weeks and months uh, to come. And there's there's some players that are already kind of on that watch. Uh, to we're, we're waiting to see what they're going to do, but I think others are going to emerge as well. Yeah. Well, that's huge for Arizona uh, to get Kylan Boswell onto that roster for next season. Uh, they, you know, they'll have uh, Kirk Kreese back. They'll have Pella Larson back, who, oh, by the way, he was just guarding Luka Doncic, apparently, in some international stuff, which uh, that seems like uh, some decent prep for a season of college basketball when you're going to face and now, nobody. And now fit Luka Doncic, right? Isn't that what we're saying? He's in shape, yeah. Yeah, apparently. Uh, yeah. You're, you're definitely not going to face anybody like fit Luka Doncic in the uh, Pac-12. So uh, certainly good for for Arizona's uh, defensive prospects there with uh, Pella Larson. Kylan Boswell will be joining them in the backcourt. I thought his dad gave some really good remarks 24-7 about it. It doesn't sound like they're going in expecting him to be the, the leading scorer or the primary offensive option. It sounds like they're willing for him to go in there and develop and, and just be a part of that system a, a year ahead of schedule, which is which is great. Uh, so before we let you go, Gigi Jackson, if he were to reclass, I mean, would that kind of solidify DJ Wagner at the top of the class? Or, or do you think there would still be some competition there if Gigi Jackson were to go ahead and come out early? You know, this is a class that – that um is debatable, you know, at the top. I think it's going to remain debatable. Uh, I think DJ Wagner has been the most impactful high school player to date, if you're going to look at the totality of his career. Uh, but I tend to think about this like moving forward, who's the best long-term prospect. I mean, I think 10 years from now, when we look back on the 2023 rankings, we're not going to, you know, they're not going to say like, 
you know, who is the best high school player? Then we want to know, I've always said this, we're projecting a futures market. So um, I'm not sure that there is a clear number one. I think there are, are players that that have tools and an opportunity to evolve. Um, you know, Xavier Booker is a guy who could who could make a claim. Justin Edwards, if he takes it to another level, uh, you know, there's there's a, a lot of guys who I think are emerging and in the process of emerging. But this is a class that as of yet does not have a definitive number one. And part of that is because uh, different players have, have already moved on who would be in high school basketball now. So if that list gets even bigger, um, we're going to see to 23 what we saw in 22, which is the final class is very different than what we initially expected because a lot of guys have just left earlier than expected. Absolutely. And and by the way, on DJ Wagner, uh, wasn't, it, wasn't it Branham who kind of has a murkier crystal ball now, you know, after we were yeah, all I do. Listen, all I do with my crystal ball is copy Branham. So like, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't tell me he was going to do, you know, I've been here three months. I've made one crystal ball. And, and it was just to copy Travis. And then he, and I don't even know, like, I'm asking, I'm like, how do I pull mine back? I'm like trying to figure out the tech of it. So yeah, it's, listen, the DJ Wagner thing is, um, I mean, that is, that is as compelling of a storyline as there is because and then you've got his, his teammate Bradshaw, uh, both with Camden, at least until this point. And then, um, uh, with New Jersey scholars as well. I mean, he's looking like a Kentucky lean right now. Um, a lot of people are starting to swing their perception of where Wagner's going to end up from Louisville to Kentucky. Um, but, you know, there's also, um, you know, Kentucky was once thought to be a favorite for, for Cade Cunningham, too. And then it swung back to Oklahoma State. So it's it's just going to be very interesting um, to keep watching the way that that, that evolves. I, I do think that continues to be one of the more intriguing storylines at least specific to college basketball recruiting, because it's it's pretty clear, at least as of now, he's going to be in one of those two spots. Yeah, that would be a tough pill for UK to swallow if they lose Cade because of the hiring of a, of a brother <laughs> and then were to lose uh, DJ Wagner because of the hiring of a grandfather. Be like, OK, Cal, uh, let's let's start figuring out how to uh, do some of the things you did when you were at Memphis. Uh, right after Shade and Sharp decides to come but not play. I mean, yeah, that, that's that, there's a lot of, you know, I mean, there's. Unfortunately, Kentucky's run into a lot of those those situations over the years um, for uh, for BBN folks. But they do have a couple of uh, really solid guards in the 2023 class committed uh, out of the gate already. So uh, Wildcats are, are going to be fine, I think, although they would certainly love to have uh, DJ Wagner. But uh, yeah, that should do it, man. OK, so here's the deal. I thought we were going to keep this thing at like a shorter show today because you're the recruiting expert and I don't know a ton of the ins and outs of this stuff, but uh, your expertise has shown through and we're at 33 minutes. So man, uh, it's been, it's been good. Any, any last uh, insights to add before you head back out on the road uh, for another week? No, just, uh, you know, appreciate, appreciate you doing this. Appreciate the train making an appearance in the opener there and uh, look, looking forward to getting back on the road. And as I said, Adidas all American camp and, and Nike peach jam coming up next. I actually think that was the must bus. It, it tends to make appearances uh, on our shows. And got just got a little bit of an upgrade. It, listen, if that's what he needed to do to get a player, there's no doubt in my mind he would do just that. Yeah, <laughs> send the train by. Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you guys for joining us on the uh, Ion College Basketball uh, YouTube channel. He's Adam Finkelstein. I am uh, David Cobb, and we'll catch you again soon.